Welcome to Eight Questions With. I'm your host, Patrick. I have Tito Will View. Glad you are here. Uh, our special guest, uh, Richard Rossi and Rebecca Holden, will be here in about 15 minutes. Um, I know it says I come here at 8, uh, 8 o'clock. The show starts at 8. I generally come on about 15 minutes beforehand just to talk to you guys and say hi and whatnot. And then, uh, and then our guests generally roll in about 8 o'clock or so. And then we get it going. Hey, Jaden. Glad you're here. Hopefully you had a good weekend. Hopefully you're having a good week. Yeah, I've just uh, been reading the stories about uh, about Louisiana, man. Louisiana is getting knocked flat on its butt. Uh, so eight questions is, uh, this is for replay, in case you guys are new, because we'll, I do suspect we'll have a lot of new faces in today. Um, eight questions with is a interview series that I started on my blog, The Inner Circle. And in it, I talk to people who I find interesting. Uh, they can come from all walks of life. Um, primarily, they are creative artists, be it writers, actors, directors, producers. Um, but we do talk to small business owners. We talk to film lovers. We talk to, well, we talk to anybody who wants to talk to us is really what it comes down to. Uh, if you want to talk to me, I'll definitely want to talk to you. The show, uh, it comes on between uh, three times a week, Tuesday through Thursdays. Uh, generally, it is from 8 o'clock, about 9.30 to 10, 10 o'clock. Uh, I always talk about, uh, <laughs> hi, Wayne, how are you? Welcome to the show. Hopefully, you like this. Hopefully, uh, you'll enjoy this. Uh, to explain how the show is, uh, I talk to various people from all over. Tonight, I'll be talking to Richard Rossi. Uh, he is the writer, director, and actor of uh, of um, Canaan Land, and uh, we'll also be talking to Rebecca Holden, uh, who uh, was in. Um... Hi, Amanda. Some of you might remember if you're uh, a you know if you're Knight Rider fans, uh, a Rebecca Holden played uh, April Curtis on the Knight Rider show. Um, and she's also has done uh, many, many plays. Uh, she's released records. Um, and uh, she'll be here along with uh, Richard Rossi to talk about their new film, Canaan Land, uh, which is a very interesting movie. Um, uh, I watched it, and uh, it is it's very interesting. Um, I haven't seen anything quite like, quite, quite like it in a long time. Musically speaking, I've seen it a lot, which is why I'm going to tell you right now that I like it. I like this movie a lot. I, I think it has a lot going for it. It's definitely what I love when I appreciate more than anything else. It's made from the heart. It's made with good intentions. It's made from the heart. Um, it is, uh, Canaan Land is generally a, is considered a faith-based movie. So it is family-oriented, though the Nah, the subject matter can be a little bit rough, uh, a little bit, but it has to be a little rough uh, for, the, for, the, for the good parts to come through. Um, I would say PG-13 would be a good rating for this movie. Uh, but it's going to be fun to talk to Richard Rossi and, and uh, Rebecca and see uh, how they came together. And, and, um, and we'll, you know, we'll talk about their careers. This is my first time. Um, I've talked to Rebecca Holden. Uh, as far as name recognition goes, she's probably she. I mean, I know I know who she was right away. Um, like I said, my brother, my brother loved uh, Knight Rider, so we watched it all the time, and um, so we're looking forward to that. She also has done many, many other shows. She's done a lot of episodic TV. Like I said, she's also done plays. Uh, Richard Rossi himself is as an actor. Who's worked hard? Um, this is not his first um, faith-based movie. He's done a couple of others, so it'll be interesting to talk to them. The lineup is going to be—it's uh, going to be both of them at the same time. 
uh, we're gonna do, we're gonna we're gonna interview them both at the same time. They're both gonna be here at the same time, so it'll be a uh, it'll be a yeah. It won't be a one on one. It'll be a one on two. Uh, they're both based in Los Angeles, so uh, it's you know it's five o'clock back there. So, but they'll be here. Like I said, they'll be here in about ten minutes or so. Uh, okay, well, and you already know what time it is, okay? Because I have to bring out the calendar because I got ten minutes for for this for pre for pre talk. I brought the calendar. So tomorrow we have scheduled. Uh, tomorrow we have scheduled uh, actress Brittany Wolf on September first. Um, I hope that goes through. I'm having a little trouble with. I know that she was a. Uh, She's in the middle of moving, so I'm hopefully well beginning of the month of 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 uh, August. But you know how that works out. Or we're hoping that I'm hoping that uh, I'm hoping that everything is fine. But we'll see. Um, I hope she makes it because Brittany Wolf is one of my favorite actresses, and she is a rising talent, and she's a she's a hell of an actor. Um, and I, I really want you guys to meet her quite a bit. Uh, on September second. Uh, eight o'clock. Um, Dustin Ardeen will be here, uh, another young actor on the ri on the rise. Um, uh, he's based in Texas, or no, he's based in L.A., but he's born and raised in Texas, and he'll be here uh, on Thursday the second at eight p.m. Uh, let's see. Uh, next seventh, uh, next week on the seventh, we have artist and publisher Vance Capley will be here. Uh, Vance Capley is a tremendously talented artist. I'm excited for him to come out, to come on the show. He also put, publishes as a magazine, Monster Magazine. So he is very, very creative and very, very uh, um, talented. And we'll be talking about his art and uh, where he got to start at and, you know, the world of art today. Uh, next Wednesday, uh, the 8th, Next Wednesday, or the 8th of, no, not next Wednesday, but the 8th, we have actress, producer, um, Leah McKendrick will be here. Um, and I, like I said, I'm always excited to tell you who I got because I feel like I got some really interesting people to talk to. And Leah McKendrick is one of them. Um, absolutely love Leah McKendrick. She's uh, extremely talented, tremendous writer. She's written a movie called uh, MFA, Master of Fine Arts. She's done, um, she produced a beautiful short film called Unicorns. Um, she also uh, wrote it. Um, she also wrote and, uh, and starred in a, a powerful, good short. If you like superheroes as much as I do, uh, she also did uh, Pamela and Ivy, which is a, a retelling uh, of, of, the, of Poison Ivy, which I, I totally dig. And then on, nine, on the ninth, we have uh, our friend uh, from the YouTube channel, Makeup Mom and Son. Our friend Michelle will be here and talking about her channel and her her uh, her life and uh, uh, how she got started. At, you know, on on the on the tube, and um, her channel is really blowing up. And uh, she's even got her own interview series going on, which is uh, top notch. I gotta say, it's top notch. Um, so she'll be here on the ninth. At 8 p.m. And uh, yeah, uh, as far as the uh, as far as the uh, Sundays go, we have on the for the midnight hour, uh, the midnight hour uh, next week on the fifth will be uh, held on Hobbs's channel, Hobbs Horror. And I guess I still don't know what we're quite what we're doing. Uh, I do know that we will see the return of. Of the spices, uh, Becky, Vince, uh, Dragon, and uh, Artemis, they will be coming back for a guest appearance on the fifth, and then uh, on the twelfth and on the nineteenth. Um, well, I'm hosting the show, and I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. I think I'm going to do something with music on the nineteenth. I don't know what it is. We might be talking about the best soundtracks or best scores or something like that. Um, I'm going to figure it out. Um, and then on the 26th, we have two shows, as we always do. We have two shows. Um, 
Uh, I will be on the Nightwatch channel on the 26th with Nightwatch and uh, Coriander and Biff and Cadaver Club. We, uh, we're we doing our, our ISC, mo- our ISC uh, midnight show. And yes, we are going there on our fourth show. We are going to the Human Centipede Part 1. Um, yeah, it makes sense. Cor- Coriander wanted to do it. Why not? I think it's badass. Uh, and then on the 26th, on the midnight hour, that will be on Hobbs' channel once again, and that will be the kickoff of the spook. Oh, no, wait a minute. I think, I think we have a special guest host, but I'm not going to say quite yet. I think we might have a special guest host, but I do know that it's going to be the kickoff of the spooktacular, uh, spooktacular 2021. All right. Uh, feel free to share us out if anybody's still watching me. Uh, I'm going to share this out to Reddit. And thank you so much, Kevin K., for uh, for putting me into your group, allowing me to promote the show. Uh, very grateful. Uh, tremendous, uh, tremendous asset uh, um, that Kevin um, has done. He's uh, He started a Tuber Chat uh, Reddit group. And it has a, about 184 people in it, and uh, we are allowed to post our um, our videos whenever we. Uh... Oh, okay. Yeah, he's allowed us to uh, connect. Uh, anytime we go do a live stream, uh, he has allowed us to come inside this group and just put the t- uh, put our link in. So um, uh, there's 184 of us, and um, so every every interview I come in and I go ahead and I share, and uh, I definitely give Kevin K a shout out every time I do this. I think it's awesome. Thank you so much. So there we go. And there's the lovely Brittany. Oh. Okay, I had a feeling about that. Okay. Uh no problem. Hmm. It happens. All right. Wow. Yeah. All right. Our guests will be here in approximately three or four minutes. Hopefully everybody's doing well. Uh, Been paying attention to the hurricane down in Louisiana. Uh, we have friends down there, me and the cheetah, and uh, uh, we were really blessed to see that they marked themselves safe. Uh, I was really glad to see that. Um, that's one aspect of Facebook that's somewhat good, I guess. I could actually say that. Um, they do allow you to mark yourself safe during a, any sort of event. Um, so that's good. So uh, our friend Elaine, um, uh, she marked herself as safe. And we're really, really happy for for that. Um, gosh. There will be a question and answer show after, uh, after our, our initial interview. So uh, if you get here and you want to ask questions from uh, either uh, uh, Richard or uh, Rebecca, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, Oh, thank you. Thank you. Coming on in. Coming on in. They will be here momentarily. I don't know why I'm so tongue twisted today or dry. Hmm. (laughs) Makes for an interesting pre-show, doesn't it? 
generally I'm very a lot more talkative than this. Uh, I do suspect we'll have some a lot of new faces here tonight. Uh, I know that Richard has, has worked very hard promoting the show, and I appreciate that. So uh, to all those who are sitting outside uh, watching, come on in uh, and say hi to the chat. And, uh, yeah, we'll get this party going here in any second now. Oh, yeah, we got to say happy birthday to our good friend, uh, Charles Cochran. Uh, it's his birthday today, so we want to say give him a shout out for that. Happy birthday, Charles. Um, our friend Sean Kane, director of uh, Sean Kane, is also his birthday. I want to say happy birthday to Sean Kane. He has probably been the singularly most important person for my blog's transition. Um, I try to start writing... Um, I started writing uh, film reviews, and Sean Kane was instrumental in helping me get going. Uh, oh, okay, we got our first guest here. Greetings, greetings. Hi, Patrick. How are you? Good, good. Oh, no, don't tell me you do this. Does not like me too much uh, lately. <laughs> it does not like me too much lately. Can you hear us, Rebecca? Hi, Rebecca's coming in. I see her name. Okay. I see I'm the wheel see. spinning on my end, so that means Rebecca is on the way. Rich. Beautiful light because Rebecca is an angel and her angelic light. I see light right now. Uh oh. Can you hear me? I hear you. Oh, okay. If you, uh, this is the engineer. <laughs> I, I hear you. Okay. I don't know why the camera's not working. This is a brand new computer, a uh, laptop, Richard. So, pardon. This is a brand new laptop. So oh. this, is, this is the first time I'm using it, and I don't know why the camera's not on. Oh, but you could hear me. I yeah. hear. Yeah. Okay, I hear you. I see you. I see you, a you light. See yeah, I see a light for Rebecca. Well, maybe that's God. <laughs> That, that could be. Well, it Sister could be. Sarah brings God to people, so that's quite possible. Yeah, hold on. Why isn't on. I, I'm having a hard time with uh I'm having a hard time once people come in, all of a sudden my uh my 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 connection goes all 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 gooey. Hi Tiffany. Um You're I see the, movement. I see everybody movement. Say, it says everybody can see you and hear you. No, I can't hear her though. I you hear can't you. hear me. I hear you. I hear you. If that hey, Patrick, can you hear me? I hear you. I hear you, Richard. Yeah, I hear Pat you both. Patrick can't hear me. Nope, I hear you. Oh, okay. Rebecca's not speaking yet. That's why you're hearing me. Okay. Oh, okay. It doesn't look. It doesn't matter. There's something wrong. No, 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 no. I'm just, I'm just waiting for her. It looks like there's some sort of a uh, light. And then, I, uh, no, I, I understand. I see, I see it also, Patrick. Oh. I, I see the three squares. I see the three of us. Mm -hmm. I don't um, understand. There are, there, there are four lights. <laughs> what? Oh, my God. Okay, I hear her a little bit. 
Okay, so uh, you know what? I think what they're doing, okay, I think they're just trying to work. They're just trying to work it out. <laughs> hey! hey, there you are. Uh, there's that. Richard. Oh, hey. There's, there's that. Hey, buddy. hey, Patrick. How you doing, buddy? There's the beautiful silver blue man. <laughs> Okay. Oh my God. Rebecca said it. Maybe there's something over the camera. I haven't used this before. And yeah, there was a uh... very good. That's good. Okay. Um, you want to see what you look like on there? Okay. Well, let's see what happens. Here we go. Hello, it looks like gentlemen. Looks like you. Nice Yay. to see you. How are you today? You're, you're outside. Good, good. How are you? Oh, I'm looking oh. down. I, it needs to be a little bit higher. Okay. It's good though, right? Mm -hmm. Are we all good to go, guys? Hold on, I'm just going to get a little higher here. How is your day going so far, gentlemen? Wonderful. Very good, Rebecca. How are you? <laughs> Couldn't be better. It looks beautiful where you're at. Hmm? You look absolutely beautiful where you're at. I couldn't hear you. I'm going to get him it, to get the uh, speaker as well. Because okay. it's a little far away from me, and it's hard to hear from just the... Um... The microphone in the camera lens. I mean, in the the... What am I saying? Yeah, there's uh, like a little team. Joel, can you bring the the uh, Bluetooth speaker as well? Work. Huh? Work. Okay. Um, very carefully lift. I can uh, hear their their uh, conversation uh, a lot better with the Bluetooth. It always works better. How's that? That's, that's going to be too high. That's too high. Mm -hmm. Let me take the laptop off. Take the laptop. All right. Yeah, we always, we all, <laughs> this sort of thing happens once in a while, but it makes it more entertaining. It makes it more down to, down to earth, it makes it more real. <laughs> well, thank you, Patrick, for uh, having you, uh, Rebecca and I on. Oh, no, my, my, uh, my pleasure. There's some beautiful trees behind you, Rebecca. Thank you. It's a lovely day. I think we might, we just might be getting a little bit of fall weather now, finally. Yeah. It was like 105 in the valley on, on Sunday when I came out of yeah. church. You know, I, I'm there always early in on Sunday mornings to prepare all the music and rehearse everybody. And you, you leave in the morning and it's, it's nice and cool and by the time I come out of church at noon, it was like a hundred million degrees. Yes. Yes. I was uh, preaching at church outside on Sunday afternoon. So I was, I said, Jesus, Hey, I'm doing this for you. So please keep me from fainting. Just got all headroom. Uh, uh, yeah, we had uh, thunderstorms. Yeah, but I need the Bluetooth speaker. So yeah. yeah, I don't know. Yeah, if we, we, we've uh, we've actually enjoyed uh, we've actually enjoyed one of the wettest summers here in, in Michigan since I've been here. Um, wow. It's oh, rained you so much. In Michigan? Here. You're in I am Michigan? Michigan, but I am a new. Uh, yeah, I'm outside of Ann Arbor. Friend. I have a very good friend who's a filmmaker in Mich Michigan. Mm. Do you know DJ oh, really? Perry? Okay. Uh, no, but I bet you he's in the group I'm in. I'm in a, yes. a Michigan filmmakers group. Yes, I did a film or two, uh, several, I guess, for DJ. Mm. Yeah, and he's done quite okay. well, with him, I think. He has a group of uh, investors who fund his films, and he's done everything locally. He keeps it all there in Michigan, and mm -hmm. yeah, he's done really well. He's a good guy. Tell yep. him hello for me. I've heard good things about him. I definitely will. Yeah, I, I, I have a, I still got to crack into the, I still got to crack into the Michigan filmmakers. Uh, I, I, I know a, f a lot of the performers here, um, mm -hmm. 
but it's different. We we were actually doing very well here. We our our governor, our former governor Granholm, she uh, she gave a, 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 a TV a movie uh, tax incentives mm -hmm. and to encourage filmmaking to come here. And mm -hmm. we were doing really well. We had a bunch of projects come here, but then uh, once she left office and um, Rick Snyder came on board, he he ended it. So all that production money went out the state. So it was pretty. It was pretty sad. Mm. Well, all that. right, now we're all settled up. We're all saddled up, ready to settle in. Let's get let's get this party started. So, uh, Canaan Land, uh, Richard. Yes. Um, so obviously, this this is a very personal film to you, uh, yes, for sure. Much. And um, so, before I start about Canaan Land, I'd like to know about you when you when you first started in the business. Is what came first for you? I mean, was it the filmmaking that came first for you, or your, or or the um, being involved in the church? I mean, um, what, what, what the was church? the the church was more first, Patrick. I did make little movies as a boy with a Super 8 camera and my friends, but I actually um, started a church and was trying to reach out to the community. And so I had the idea of making a film. We were, we were doing these healing services and I had the thought, I really was, I had this like right brain, Holy Spirit side, praying for the sick and trying to follow the Holy Spirit, but I had a very left brain kind of scientific side. So I thought, why don't we set up a bunch of film cameras at the healing service? Because we're doing these healing services. A couple thousand people were coming. And I wasn't like the old school faith healers, like, like say, Oral Roberts or Benny Hinn, where they would have everyone come to the stage. I believe that Christ was in each and every person, and they could each pray for one another. So they didn't come to me. They Wherever they were seated, I would have the people around them pray for whoever was sick. But I wanted to have the cameras capture what happened or didn't happen. And so we, I, I hired a film crew to set up film cameras all over the auditorium and just film what was going on. So we had, oh, maybe 20 hours of film to edit through. And now how, how, oh, how old were you when you, when, the, when you did this? Um, I was in my 20s. And mm -hmm. um, I had this idea to integrate secular mm -hmm. music with it, which in that Christian evangelical culture, they had a mm -hmm. binary worldview where everything was divided between sacred and secular. But like I had Whitney Houston singing, um, he fills me up, and I and it, within this documentary, I, I used um, the Who, see me, feel me, touch me, heal me. I used uh, uh, Neil Diamond, um, touching me, touching you, sweet Caroline, and we we edited it into a film, but we made it in such a way that it was um, a lot different than many uh, Christian shows, and that we had it on secular television after the Arsenio Hall show and the Johnny Carson show, and uh, it was my way to try to present that we were trying to follow Jesus and pray for the sick and share his love and healing power. And and a, a, a Hollywood filmmaker from India named Amin Q. Shadri um, thought it was really um, very creative how we did it. And he said, you know, I just want to encourage you to maybe think about pursuing filmmaking. If you're ever out here in Hollywood, um, look me up. And he lived on Mulholland Drive by Jack Nicholson and Marlon Brando. And I made a trip from Pennsylvania where I had the church and visited him. And um, we had a wonderful friendship. And um, so it literally started with me as a minister, like thinking, hey, maybe filmmaking is a way we could share the gospel. That that was my motivation. And but he thought that the way I was doing it was unique. And um, he encouraged me to pursue filmmaking. And that's kind of how I got started doing it. Now, Rebecca, now everybody knows who you are. I mean, you, you, I mean, <laughs> We we know we know we know about your career. I mean, but I mean, as far but as you know, being on you TV, to say, Patrick, and I must say, it's a joy to meet you today, live and in person here on Zoom. <laughs> or I guess yes, we're on yes. on, a, on a different little network today, a Streamyard, yeah, I think it is. But it's such a pleasure to meet you and to be on the show with my dear friend and co-star and director and producer Richard Rossi. Yeah, and and dear friend is true because Patrick, um, Rebecca, and I making this film, we would talk about the film and things in our lives that related to this film, and we would discuss the Bible, discuss our lives. So Rebecca and I, it, it's really been a real friendship where um, she was the perfect person for the part because 
when you have a friend like Rebecca, the drama is in front of the camera and not behind the camera because you're like two friends that are close friends really wanting to get the message out. It made it really great. Thank you. That's very kind of you to say, Richard. I think um, uh, this is show business, you know, mm -hmm. and I think an actor has to be aware that for the producers and, and, and all of their colleagues with whom they're working, um, time is money and you show up and your work ethic is very important. Uh, having done your homework and, and being ready to work and being flexible on set and making everyone's job as easy as possible. So we're there to create and to, um, you know, to touch people. But we also have to remember that we have to do it within a, a time frame. And, and, and uh, it's, a, it's a work project. Mm -hmm. And we have to be good workers and uh, good stewards of our, our time and uh, of everyone's efforts. Rebecca, I, you know, what it really caught, what really struck me was it seems like for you, it's a, it's a, a it's a two. It's a two type of. You know, it's a tale of two sides. Uh, I have a feeling that before you were uh, uh, acting, you were involved in a ch in the church as well. And then you came oh, out to Hollywood. In you Your instincts okay. are absolutely right. I grew up in church. Um, I sang a solo of "Jesus Loves Me" when I was a a, a tiny little thing. Uh, I grew up singing in the choir, and uh, you know, Wednesday nights were Bible study and church uh, choir rehearsal, and Sundays were, you know, so some churches I went to had three services on Sunday, and if you were in in uh, the choir, you had to sing at least two. So, uh, church was a part of my life always. Yeah, I grew up in the South in Texas, so uh, my grandparents, when I visited them in the summer, they they lived in a small town in West Texas, and the only things in that little town were the Dairy Queen and the First Baptist Church. So, well, when you when you got into when you got into when you got into your acting, was the act mm -hmm. was it was this sort of a, was this did you get into acting for you or was did you get into acting for somebody else like someone else encouraged you to do so? I got into acting as an accident. <laughs> of course, I had been in um, all the musicals in in high school, and I had performed at Six Flags Over Texas. And but I always thought of myself as a singer who dances, a singer who acts. Who I was primarily music was my life. I was a voice major, piano minor in in college, so music, every, everything revolved around music. Uh, and I was in New York. Uh, continuing my music studies with uh, private teaching uh, from uh, vocal teachers uh, from Juilliard. And an agent saw me and insisted I uh, be under contract for Breck Shampoo. So I started doing all their commercials and print ads, and that led to many, many other commercials like Ivory Soap and Dentine and Chevrolet and Kellogg's and on and on. Aaron Spelling, the very prolific television producer, saw one of my commercials that aired on the Super Bowl. And I was sent out to the West Coast and started doing episodic television. And a career blossomed that I had really never anticipated. <laughs> but I've been very fortunate and very blessed to have had a career that has enabled me to make so many friends, uh, travel the world, uh, have fascinating experiences, um, meet incredibly wonderful people, and it's been very, very fulfilling and rewarding. So sometimes God has uh, uh, another purpose that you never even dreamed of. Yeah, it, it seemed to me like uh, you know, was when I when I was looking over, it seemed to me like you're a little bit. I mean, I don't. I could be wrong about this, but this is how I looked at it. You were like sort of like a reluctant star, you know, like you 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 were here, but you. It, it, it sounds to me like you had your heart set on doing more work in the church and more, you know, being helping people, you know, more that way with your voice and uh, and your singing. Uh, acting was there, but it almost seemed like, in a sense, because you just you you just. Uh, I don't know. You just you, we were we were waiting for you. We loved you. Okay, I can tell you right now, my brother. He's so excited. That I'm talking to you because we are a huge Aww. nightmare. We are a huge That's nightmare. That's very kind of you. Well, anything that I'm going to do, especially if I'm um, 
doing it for others. I want to, I want to do it to the very best of my ability. So I, I did study acting. I learned so much being on set. Uh, I was so blessed to work right away with wonderful actors and wonderful directors that help bring the best out of you. Um, I think if you are a true music artist, you sing from your soul, you sing from your heart. And that's where acting comes from anyway. We, we are to be, we, we're not to act. <laughs> we are to be, and we are to be real. And my music comes from that same place. Um, but I guess I will always think of myself, and you know, as, as a musical artist, um, yeah. I, I sing constantly. I just sang this weekend for a big event for a religious freedom. Um, two pastors were guest speakers. Ricky Schroeder was one of the speakers. People remember him from, of course, his wonderful career. Um, he's all grown up now, but he <laughs> he's has very a, a passion about life. Uh, and so I, I get asked to sing our national anthem at so many events. And I'm so honored and privileged to sing our national anthem and other patriotic music uh, for so many charities and so many events. I'll be singing at AmpFest 21 uh, in Miami in October. Um, and I, I, um, I, I always feel honored uh, to do that. I'm always asked to sing our national anthem and that's always a joy. For me and uh it's a it's a gift i i have to give for rebecca, any event do, who who needs a little patriotism rebecca rebecca does the best job with the national anthem how did you would uh how are how did you how she did does you it great Richard she does it thank you it's great thank you, thank you know? so much coming from you richard uh, well, you know, a lot of people with the national anthem. Yeah, as a musician, I'm very I, I get so frustrated. I get so frustrated with the national anthem. These singers that do like a thousand. Uh, how did you? How did you two be? And change the melody, you know. But Rebecca does it. She trusts the melody, and she just does it so great. Thank you. Thank you. I love singing. Anybody needs the anthem, call on me. <laughs> I'm a true patriot. I love our country. I think America is the greatest force for good that exists on this planet. Um, I think our founders created a miracle when they created our, our constitution. And um, our, our republic will soon be coming back very soon. I think I cut you off earlier, Patrick. I apologize. I think you were trying to ask something. Sometimes I don't quite hear the people coming in. I think there may be a little delay too, because yeah. I noticed Patrick's reaction is a little delayed after uh, we speak. So there may be some of that going on too. Yeah, I don't technology, sure if it, don't you know? If it's <laughs> my speaker or yours, I know that uh, it, I hear it, it's like crunchy. I'm going to ask the chat. Is it? Uh... Oops. Patrick Who did we is, lose, Patrick? Uh, I lost Patrick's, Patrick's gone. Baseball of a spinning wheel there um but uh yeah i really like your singing rebecca because you're like the old school singers that trust the melody and don't like there was a a recent the trend philosophy where, like, were, of yeah. life i choose joy <laughs> i don't know i don't know why it's, it's breaking up like it is you're back now patrick and you were saying oh there's patrick back hi yeah. patrick okay. welcome back you're, welcome back um, so, yeah, okay. I'm just okay. That sounds a hundred percent better now. Good. Okay. So I was going to ask you guys, how did you, uh, uh, as far as the the country goes? I mean, how? I mean, how did you guys meet? I mean, you're, uh, you know, you're singing, and Richard, you're a filmmaker. So I mean, how did you guys? Uh, where did you come up with the idea anyway for the uh, for Canaan Land? Well, and how did that, how did you get involved, Rebecca? Well, well, I did re meet, be, meet Rebecca because of her singing at a church. Mm -hmm. I saw that she was singing at a church of a preacher I knew, and um, I thought, I wow. Got a, I got an email from, from a church. Yeah. Yeah, I loved, I saw, I thought, Rebecca has a great look for Sister Sarah, because Sister Sarah is beautiful in a mixture of the spiritual and the kind of the sensual beauty. And um, and then then she's singing in a church 
So I thought, wow, she's in, she's, I didn't know that she understood the church world also. I mean, a, an actress can play any part, of course, an actress could play a female evangelist, whether she was a church person or not. But the fact she understood this culture so well, and she grew up in the church, and she's also seen the uh, charlatans in the church also. So I thought, wow, she is perfect. So I invited her to audition. I had come up with the idea, you asked about that, uh, Patrick, based on when I was doing this healing ministry, I was invited to preach with other big names on these telethons and Christian TV stations. And I, I discovered, I, I mean, you always know there's there's fakes, right? You always know there's uh, con men out there, but the level to which it was going on, I discovered it was really amazing. I mean, like one church was doing these, putting gold glitter in their HVAC system and blowing around gold craft store glitter and telling the people it was from the golden streets of heaven. It was the Shekinah glory of God. And if they wanted God's blessing to give them thousands of dollars and the church just exploded with growth. And I thought, wow, you know, PT Barnum was right about a sucker born every minute. And then like some of the other big names were faking miracles. So I wanted to, I, I had a passion to start writing a story to contrast the true and the false, the wheat and the tares, because there's many sincere preachers and sincere Christians that love the Lord and they're, 100% genuine, but I, I I felt like the Christian films I'd seen, there's a lot of good Christian films I've enjoyed very much, but I felt like sometimes they're always making the Christian characters like they're so perfect, and then the atheist characters are so evil, and I thought I wanted to show the nuances that within the church itself, you have the good and the bad, and um, so uh, once uh, uh, Rebecca came over to audition at Richard Krause's house, uh, my cam uh, one of my cameramen and editors, and uh, I read with me and Richard filmed it. I thought, oh, this is our sister, Sarah. And she's been a godsend to play the part. Rebecca's been a real godsend. What, Rebecca, let me come back to you because, you know, let me come back to you, Rebecca, because um, how, I mean, because you've been in the church for many, many years as well. Did you see did you see the church like how Richard saw it? Did you see the. You know, some of the shenanigans that were being pulled and people being deceived. I mean, did you actually see that when you were when you were going to churches and, and singing at them or whatnot? Or did you, did you ever see that side not, of it? Not the church that I grew up in, but, but uh, I would spend a great deal of time in, in Nashville when I was on Perk Records. And I attended various, um, you know, Pentecostal churches. Assembly of God Church, all kinds of various churches with with my band members and would be on the road and sometimes we'd go to this or that. So I've I've witnessed what Richard's talking about. I'm I've seen it. I've uh, experienced it. Um, and, you know, you see all all kinds of things. And I think we're supposed to have discernment. You know, God expects us to you. He gave us a brain for a purpose. He gave us judgment and we're supposed to have good discernment and um, weigh what we see and discern what is real and what isn't. Um, I know that when my, my mom passed away a few years ago, I just wanted to go back to my roots. And I found a little church that does the old hymns. And I do the music for them. I play piano and sing all the old hymns uh, at this little church. And it just feels right to me, you know. I mean, your, your relationship with God is, is a personal relationship, or it should be. And you you have to find that place where it's real and you can speak to God and hear his voice. Uh, Richard, you're, you're, this is not your, Canaan Land was not your first, it was not your first rodeo as far as uh, the subject go about talking about the, the church and, and its uh, shortcomings and, you know, among some of the people in it. Uh, you also did uh, a movie about Amy Simple, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, that was now, my first. That was my first feature film, and I um, I related to her a lot because she was had a healing ministry in Los Angeles and Hollywood in the twenties, but she was also quite uh, broken, and and this took such a toll on her personally. So I really related to her because I I felt like I was trying to heal all these other people, and I needed healing myself. So I found her to be kind of a soulmate for me when I read more about her. And I decided I wanted to make a film about her. I'd never made a feature film, but um, I was very blessed that pretty quickly two royal families in Hollywood reached out to me and said they wanted to be a part. One was, uh, you know, Ron Howard, such a great director. 
um, and, and Clint Howard, his brother, and Rance Howard reached out to me. And Rance was telling me growing up in Oklahoma that he would go to the tent meetings of these uh, revivalists and evangelists and and that he loved uh, Amy Simple McPherson. Rance uh, sadly passed away um, not too long ago, a couple years ago. But Rance and I started meeting and I showed him what I'd written and he thought it was really well written and encouraged me and was like a mentor to me. I just loved him so much. I recently visited his grave at Hollywood uh, forever and just broke down crying. I just loved him so much. So he played Amy Simple's father in the film. The second call from a amazing Hollywood family was from the Chaplin estate in Ireland. Uh, Cara Chaplin, uh, Charlie Chaplin's uh, granddaughter called me and told me did my grandfather, Charlie Chaplin was very close with her and that she would use drama in her church and he helped her with that. And so Kara was in the film also. And uh, yeah, so I, I felt pretty intimidated because I thought, here's Rance Howard. He's the father of a royal family in Hollywood, the patriarch and father Ron Howard. And I've never directed a film ever. And but he was just so kind to me. And he always kept telling me, I believe in you, Richard. You have the talent to pull this off. And I would almost talk myself out of it. I remember one time I said, Rance, maybe you shouldn't be in my film. I don't have any experience. I don't want to hurt your reputation if it's not good. <laughs> And he said, now, Richard, you're just getting nervous. He said, my son gets nervous, too, I'm on shoots, and you're going to do fine. And he was always just so kind, you know, and believed in me. And, um, yeah, so that was the same territory. She was a female evangelist like Sister Sarah. So I think I think that was like a rough draft in the sense of, like, visiting that subject matter The in that film enabled me to have more confidence to do this um, this fictional film and to make it a contemporary story about a female evangelist played by Rebecca. Rebecca. Um, yes, sir. Yeah. So, I mean, can you, you know, how much of, how much was sister Sarah actually Rebecca? Um, she, she, I felt at home in her skin. I'll put it that way. I just felt at home in her skin and Richard was wonderful in that. Um, as, as we were filming, we would discuss scenes and I, he was very, very lenient with me, letting me speak Sarah's words in a way that I felt naturally was um, the way the words would, would come to me. So he gave me, he trusted me, I suppose, but he gave me a lot of leeway in, um, in my dialogue and, uh, uh, where the scene would uh, stay identical to Richard's vision, but he gave me freedom. And um, that's always nice for an actor. So um, I inhabited Sarah's skin uh, in a very um, real way. And I, I think she she came into me. So it, it, it just felt right um we talked about this yesterday during the pre-show richard um canaan land is um i called it a guerrilla filmmaking i call it guerrilla filmmaking um i thought it was uh i thought it was brilliant in that sense um i thought you took a lot of chances i mean uh it's very gritty uh it's very honest uh, the, the, it's film, you know, how you, how you filmed it, you filmed it documentary style yes. and it comes across, it comes across like that. Where did you, uh, where did you come up with the idea of, of, uh, well, is this an idea that you wanted to do or was it, is this an idea that you had to do because of the, uh, of the budget or the, uh, or the constraints? Cause filming a movie in Los Angeles is a daunting process. I mean, even yeah. for an independent movie, you still got to have money to do a movie in LA. Yes, well, because so many films are made here, people are much more aware of, hey, you don't have a permit and those kind of things. So mm. we were shooting in a lot of iconic locations without, you know, stealing shots without permits. And and one, but you know, um, Orson Welles, who's one of my heroes as, as a director, because he was he was so courageous when he made Citizen Kane, and he got so much backlash for it. And at the end of his life, so many times he could have bowed down and just done what Hollywood wanted, but he he kept making films his way independently, and. Um, but one of his things that he said that really touched me I, in an interview was he said, when you're making an independent film on your own, you have to be open to God's divine accidents. He called them divine accidents. 
And he said, because you don't have a studio with a huge money hose to wash away every problem, when you're doing it without backing, you have to ask God to help you and that everything that seems to quote unquote maybe go wrong or that seems like a liability, that that becomes a divine accident if you use your creativity to turn that for good into something really creative. Like as an example, um, Rebecca and I and uh, Joel was there with us. We were all down the Grove that day, I remember. We were shooting at the Grove and we got some great footage at the Grove, which if you're not from Los Angeles, it's a beautiful place to shop with hundreds of uh, restaurants and shops. And um, you walk around outside and, and you'll see Billy and Rebecca. Very Christmassy you know, too for that Christmas time yeah. of year for the scene. Yeah, it was, it was all the beautiful. decorations. Yeah. Yeah, and we were by the kettle. Yeah, and the Salvation Army with the kettle, and and we had Rebecca at one point singing underneath that with Oh Holy Night. But there was a moment where a security guard yelled at uh, my cameraman at the time was Jeff that day, and said, "Hey, put away those big cameras." He had the nice cameras, right? And you don't have a permit. And uh, so here we had a scene to shoot where Billy and Sarah break up, which is a spoiler alert. I apologize if you don't know. There's a point where she she throws them out of her church and her life. But anyways, I said, you know, Jeff, just sit in the back of my uh, Jeep. Here's my cell phone. Shoot it on the cell phone because these cell phones can can look pretty good, actually, nowadays. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, he sat in the back of my Jeep and Rebecca was in the passenger side. I was in the driver's side. And we played the scene where she confronts him and says, you know, you you um, you you came into my temple, the church, and you ruined it. And you came into the temple of my body after 14 years of purity and you I don't know. I should have listened to my instincts. And you're not the first man to use faith to try to get get to me. But you were just so good mm -hmm. at it. And she get, right, reads in the riot act. Well, people that wrote about the film said that it's it was so artistic how we had this more campy, funny first half where Billy's doing all his uh, his crazy stuff. And along with, uh, you know, Rebecca's kind of letting him do all this stuff. But, she, but they said when Rebecca has her her epiphany and the arc of her character to confront him and break up, it shifts to a very gritty look within the Jeep, you know? So had we said, Oh, we don't have a permit. We got in trouble. Let's leave. But we, we, as Orson Welles said, we went with a divine accident and we shot it on the cell phone, but it actually changed the tone of the film right at the right moment. So, you know, that's what Orson Welles talked about. Like he would say, Hey, God wanted me to get that shot this way with that divine accident. And so yeah, you have yep. to kind of roll with it, you know? I, 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 like I said to you yesterday, I, I think it's brilliant. I mean, well, you. Um, you know, for, for how you did it and, and, you know, and like I said, it, the most important thing is it, that you made it, made it from the heart and, you know, it really does come across more than anything else about Canaan land is that, that it's from the heart, you know, that's, mm -hmm. that's the most important thing. I mean, I know I've seen a lot of movies with a lot bigger budgets and they're heartless. They have no soul to it. You know, uh, yes. they may be technically better. They may have all the equipment, all the pros and everything else. But but with you, where you're coming from and your message that you are trying to share, it comes from the heart. And so it works. It works on, on a lot of different levels. And, you know, I think it's awesome. I just do. I think it's I thought I thought Rebecca was outstanding. Um, well, she's won two acting awards yes. already for her, her acting. Most recently, the Marina Del Rey. Film festival. In fact, I have that, Rebecca. The next time we meet, remind me to bring you your award because I, I, I didn't. I at the moment they announced <laughs> Rebecca, you. and here's the award. Where's Rebecca? I just realized. Oh my God! I got to run up there and get it. Rebecca's not here. She was singing in Las Vegas, I think. Oh. But uh, Rebecca, thank you so just, much. Uh, is getting all kind of critical acclaim for her acting in this movie. Yeah, you know, I'll be honest with you, Rebecca. Watching you act in, in Canaan Land, um, as a fan of your work. It was frustrating. It was frustrating because, um, because I mean, I watched you when you were doing your TV work, and you know, and and I always thought that just me personally, I was always waiting for you just to to blow up. I mean, you were just so, you know, awesome. I mean, you really were a strong actress. You had chops, you had looks, and you had elegance, and you had such professionalism. But then you just sort of like vanished a little bit. And um, is it okay to ask you, did you just step away from the spotlight? Did you just like, was there something that had come up? Did you just decide that maybe you didn't want to act as much as you wanted to sing and you decided to focus on your singing career? I will answer that question. 
Uh, first, I want to tell you, I am very grateful for your kind words. Um, that means a lot to me. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Patrick. You're um, I took this, fi this film, um, it was, um, a labor of love. Uh, the script has such meaning to it. And, um, I'm, I'm just so grateful at, at the, the reception that, that it's, it's, it's getting from people like yourself, Patrick. Um, people like the, the, the ones who were judging the Marina Del Rey, Marina Del Rey Film Festival. Um, it, it's, uh, it's very gratifying, um, to an actor's work. That's why we do it to, to, um, entertain people. But this, this film and what you said is particularly applicable because this film doesn't just entertain. We have the goal that it also can touch hearts. And, and if it brings the message of the gospel in the midst of a movie, it can change lives. So that's the mission. You know, we, uh, we have um, a very powerful tool in, in film to evangelize because there are people out there that will go see a movie who, who might never set foot in a church, but they could be touched by the message of this film. So thank you for that. Thank you for what you said and that it touched your heart. It, it means more than you know. As to your other question, um, I had family members who had health problems uh, and I left to become a, a caregiver for a while. So, um, yeah, yeah. I, I stepped before. away from Hollywood and, and a family comes first. So yes. always that, that makes sense. I, I, I just always felt it had to be something like that. Yeah. But I, still I, I, but no, but no to, never... I still would take time to sing for events and charity, uh, uh, you know, events and uh, um, when I was asked to sing or make appearances, but, um, you know, a film or a t TV series is a, is a long time commitment. So. Right. Yeah. right. Uh, so going back to Cana land, I mean, uh, how did you, do, how did you put your team together, Richard? Well, um, I'd made the two prior features, um, Sister Amy, and then one about my childhood hero, Roberto Clemente, called Baseball's Last Hero. So I had a group of guys and gals that had some equipment and had worked with me. And then I decided to go to <clears throat> film school. I had never had really any formal training other than I'd taken a screenwriting class. I took a couple classes in my hometown. They had a place called Pittsburgh Filmmakers. But um, I thought, well, maybe I'll go to school. And so I had a friend of mine that said, you did it ass backwards. Most people go to school and then go out and make films. <laughs> but I actually think it was better that I made a couple films before I took formal classes and got a degree in filmmaking. Because when I took the classes, I had experience to look back and say, oh, I could have done this better. And oh, that's what, you know, I, I think it's better sometimes to try to do things and then maybe take more training. So I went to Valley College where I also teach a guitar class myself and I earned a degree in filmmaking. And so I got some wonderful professors there that um, were really encouraging to me. And then also I met a lot of people that were my fellow students like Richard Krauss who helped shoot and edit the film. Uh, I met it in the, in the film history class, uh, Don Higgins, another one of my DPs I met in, um, in cinematography class. There's an actress I play who I give a psychic reading to as Brother Billy, and then I borrow her Jeep, and and she lets me stay at her place. Uh, that actress, uh, Myla Perkins, I met in an acting class there. So um, I think like when you train or take classes, you meet other uh, people that have the same interest, you know. And um, oh, also church, um, like Jeff Griffith, who has worked a lot with me, I met through church, a church where I was actually the minister. Um, and um, so, you know, I think like sometimes people have like this view, like you come uh, in, in to Hollywood and you work in the arts and you just kind of, um, you know, they, they have like this dichotomy, like there's this Hollywood thing and then there's this real life thing. But like I have a saying that you don't just always go from A to B. Sometimes God takes you from A to C to B. And by that, I mean, like sometimes we think there's a straight path. OK, A to B, like actors will think they'll get a part by uh, sending a headshot and putting the resume on the back of the headshot and they send that and they get the part. 
But, you know, Richard Dreyfuss, a really talented actor who you may remember from a lot of films like Jaws, for, uh, he once said something I found quite interesting. He said, you know, most of my greatest parts, I didn't get it through, um, you know, submitting my headshot or my agent. You know, I mean, look at Rebecca. I, I Rebecca, the reason she got the part was I saw her sing in a church, you know. Um, I've had an, a director who heard me speak at a service and and he ended up giving me uh, several roles in his film several like two or three different films you know um uh, i uh, the sister amy the first documentary i made about her that was academy award considered the academy award said the one reason you made it into the academy award consideration on on the documentary i made about sister amy which was not the feature it was the first prior documentary i made was the fact that i interviewed her 95 year old daughter before she died and she hadn't she was a recluse and she hadn't spoken to her mother, uh, Amy Simone McPherson, for nine years prior to Amy's death. But she, uh, the reason I met her was I was doing a sales job in a, in a downturn in my creative work. And I was a, a, did well as a salesperson for a job. I, it was a soul killing job and I didn't like it very much um, as a salesperson. But I was doing it to pay the bills at the time, selling timeshares, which I'm embarrassed to say. But um, a, a, another saleswoman at the timeshare job knew the daughter and sent me to New York to meet her. And I mean, so, you know, a lot of times a team comes together through just living life and sharing your vision with people in many different places, not just in a quote unquote Hollywood world. Um, one question. Uh, let me catch up with some of the chat. I've been uh, amiss with this. Uh, first of all, your friend Peter Estrada. Oh. Uh, so hello, Richard. He's a great uh, actor and a great friend. We acted in a, I met him on set. We acted in a film together. We were played, we were both playing uh, uh, high stakes poker players. Thank you for chat coming in, Peter. I don't see the chat where I am. So thank you for letting me know. Uh, my friend, John, our doomsday crypt. Uh, he's also a caregiver, Rebecca. So he says, much respect to you. Uh, I was a caregiver as well. And uh, I can understand that uh, very much, uh, Rebecca. Um, so, yep, uh, let's see. Uh, I want to say there's some other people that commented. I want to catch up real quick. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry for those in the chat. I'm generally much better than this. Uh, let's see. She went mentioned us says, hello, Richard and Rebecca. Pleasure to meet you both. Richard, thank you for your work exposing fake, uh, fake faith healers. Mm -hmm. And Rebecca loved your work, especially as April and Knight Rider. Yep. Who, who said that? Who said uh, that? Uh, she, uh, she whines. Oh, thank you. Yep. Thank you very uh, much. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Uh, Alan, uh, Alan Toshina. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm just publishing up my interview with Rebecca for Film Facts Magazine. Oh, we'll be good. sending it to her uh, to take a look-see. It's really good. a wonderful interview. Had some delays, but it is almost ready to go. Uh, let me know. Cool. When, let me Glad know to hear when, that. Yeah, let me know when you, Alan. Let me know if you're still here with us. Let me know when you when it's done, and uh, I'll I'll do I'll put out a, a promo for you. Uh, well, that's very kind show. of you, Patrick. Oh gosh, yes. Got to got to help each other out. That's all it's all about. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, okay, see what else is going on. Everybody's saying hi. Um, a lot of folks coming in. Uh, yep, so and so on a heart out there. I agree. Um, let's see. You mentioned Eric Estrada, and you also mentioned Knight Rider. And I met Eric at one of the big uh, Star Car events. They <laughs> they have huge events all over the world, but there's one in in Las Vegas where they have the car from Dukes of Hazard and the Batmobile, wow. Knight Rider, wow. and the motorcycles from Chips, and so it's it's a really fun event. Yeah, I, I bet. I bet a lot of people. I bet you know a lot of people want the pit. want an autograph and a picture. <laughs> we use the Knight Rider car. Well, you um, know, the low budget film, Patrick. Um, we use this to our advantage because um, Rebecca was in the Hollywood uh, Christmas Parade. She was riding down Hollywood Boulevard in the kit car. Oh, and, nice! Uh, so we sh we uh, used that footage, and we wrote it into the story that Sister Sarah. <laughs> Was at, Sunday was asked as a minute right. of Hollywood to ride in the Christmas. So we have a brief scene after the breakup <laughs> where you see Rebecca waving in the Hollywood Christmas parade. So as a gorilla, Richard film, is very know. inventive and creative. Yeah. No, that, that's what I said before. It's, it's very punk rock. And I must uh, tell I everyone it. in Florida 
that when I'm there in October in Miami at the Doral, uh, we will have a kit car there. And they're raising money for the, uh, the charity by, uh, they'll be selling photo opportunities with the car. And of course, I'll be there to give hugs and hellos. So it'll be a fun time. Yeah, October 7th yeah. through 10th. Rebecca is the most gracious person with fans too. Like I've seen, I've seen like these events where like, you know, a guy comes up with tears in his eyes because, you know, it meant so much to him. You know, I mean, like Richard, who where when we did the audition for uh, Kane and Land, when Rebecca came and read with me, he was overcome because um, he, he loved Rebecca. I had a crush on her in, in the Night Rider days. And I didn't know this, but on his cell phone, his ringtone was the Night Rider theme. <laughs> and I, didn't, I didn't know all this, but when she walked in the room, he was like, ah. Oh, he, that's he, acted, sweet. he acted calm and cool and collected. Oh, he was yeah. like, why didn't you warn me? That was Rebecca Holden. Oh, my God. Well, it was a real blessing to be a part of that show that has become such an iconic part of our television history. Um, and one thing that makes me feel very blessed to be a part of it is that the theme of the show was one man can make a difference. And so when I go to all of these events, uh, fan events around the world, people come up to me and tell me the most amazing stories of what the show has meant to them, how it inspired them to follow their dream, um, accomplish their goals, and do just that, make a difference in the world. So it, it, it's become very, very meaningful to me. And uh, I just feel very blessed and honored to, um, to share that uh, with people. Let me ask you guys some, some a couple of questions real quick about um, uh, about what what does the what does the term faith based mean to you? I mean, what what does the term what does it mean for you as performer? I mean, well, I would you want to go first, Rebecca, or would you want me to go first on that one? Well, of course, it's um, the obvious is that it's a, a film that is about our faith and that inspires faith and. As I said before, it's a film that that uh, seeks not to only entertain, but to inspire faith, connect you with your faith, um, bring a message, uh, touch your heart, and possibly change your life. I mean, that's that's a very high standard for a faith-based film uh, to reach, but I think that's what we aspire for it to be. Yes, yes, I would agree on the positive side, and I'll. Oh look, you got your cute. Oh, little what do we there. have here? Uh, this oh, is what a cutie cheetah. pie! This is Paladin the cheetah. Ah. Uh, oh. Well, you know, um, your pet there. Uh, you know, I I think when you look at animals, they're able to just, your love. Yeah, they're able to give your you love, love and, and be at peace. You know, like like God is is. Dog is God spelled backwards, and they both love you unconditionally. And you know, a cat. I, I've had cats, and they'll just sit there and they'll just like be purring and at peace, and they don't feel like they got to earn your love by you know chasing twelve mice a day or doing anything. They're able to just kind of be, they're able to just kind of be, and that's what faith is about to me is kind of just knowing I have worth as a child of God, whether I achieve anything great or do anything. It's just. We have an intrinsic worth as children of God. And, you know, quoting my Orson Welles, my hero again, he said that any intelligent person has to at some point ask, is there a God? And if so, why did God put us here? And if so, what is the purpose? And so I think like faith based films should deal with themes of redemption and deeper issues. Sometimes on the negative uh, side, I get a little worried when people call us a faith based film because I don't want to be categorized. In, in the secular world's mind, they sometimes um, think, because I hang out with a lot of Hollywood folks that aren't into faith-based films that much, and they will say things like, oh, they're always really cheesy, and they, they're kind of dishonest, and they make it like it's a formula. You accept God in your life, and everything's perfect, and like a magic wand, and the Christian characters are always so pure and perfect, and they, they make the atheist people to be horrible, and like they 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 look down on it like it's not really honest and so um sometimes i i think that like i worry sometimes like i don't want people to 
judge our work at the outset and think it's not going to be good or it's not going to be well acted or well written or it's going to be I mean, I, I like Hallmark films. I'm not putting down Hallmark films. I enjoy them. But like people wow. have that thing where they think Christian films are like these very uh, uh, polished Hallmark films and they don't really, they don't, you know, they have like a negative uh, thing. So on that side, I worry a little bit. But some of the greatest films that deal with uh, faith themes to me were not maybe, maybe like within the faith based industry. I mean, as an example, Marlon Brando, an actor who I just really, really respected for his uh, talent. But he made a film called On the Waterfront in it where a priest is giving a sermon about Christ and how the crucifixion happens again and again if we don't stand up against injustice. And, and Marlon Brando was a part of these mobs that controlled the unions on the docks, and he witnessed a murder. But he was convicted through the sermon to speak up and to do the right thing. And so, like, his redemption is, to me, it's like in the priest's sermon is so powerful. And I thought, you know, this is a faith-based film in the sense that it's, it's dealing with great religious questions in such a moving way, but it's done so well artistically. So, I mean, not to be, I mean, I humbly hope and pray that we can do work that is also respected in terms of the heart and the artistry of it, that, that it doesn't come off like a preachy, a cheesy film. <laughs> That's always my well, concern about it. <laughs> well, there are good films and bad films. And by that, I mean, well executed or poorly executed films in, in every genre. That's yeah. right. Uh, but do you think that Hollywood has a, uh, do you think, I mean, because, I mean, back in the day, I mean, just a few years ago, we really wasn't that many out there. I mean, you had a few filmmakers out there, like uh, you had the Kendricks brothers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like I said, you had uh, uh, Jefferson Moore and, and his wife, Kelly. Um, but it seems like it seems like now Hollywood has discovered that, hey, uh, uh, church people have money, too. So <laughs> let's start making these movies for the for these people here. Yeah. And now you have big major studios are rolling out faith based movies. Mm -hmm. But uh, I mean, even Alex Hendrick is doing big, big movie, big budget movies now. But it seems to me like it, it has forgotten the, the soul. There's no soul to Hollywood, you know, and, and to me, I guess the question is, is it possible to to make a, uh, I don't know, mid budget film uh, with with Hollywood actors or or is it better to go with, you know, maybe people like uh, I know Alex Kendrick used his own people from his church, much like you did. Um, I, I guess to me, the bigger the movie is, the less soul it has. Um, well, we all saw Passion of the Christ, and that was that was that was a big budget movie and one of the best movies I've ever seen in my entire life. Then you have God's Not Dead, which is a beautifully executed little movie. It had a very small budget. It grossed a huge amount. I think sixty domestically and eighty something globally, um, and spawned two sequels. So um, I think it's how well you execute. The, the film and if it's able to connect with audiences. I do know there is an, a huge demographic out there, people who want good, wholesome entertainment that has a meaningful message and touches their hearts. I mean, that's what, that's what we, we want. I mean, there's, there's sure there, there's the audience who just wants big action packed movies with lots of stunts and, and, you know, all the, the bells and whistles. Uh, and then there's, the audience that's that's hungry for um, a message based film that's going to um, you know touch their emotions and reach their heart like you like you said at the beginning of this interview a movie that touches the heart so uh, I think there's a um, there's a place for all I personally am looking forward so much to seeing Jim Caviezel and I talk about Jim Caviezel who starred as Jesus in in Passion um, he has a new movie. Uh, that's that's I can't wait to see called Sound of Freedom, which will expose all the child trafficking that has gone on beneath beneath the scenes, but is so um, prevalent and horrific. Uh, it's, I can't wait to see that one. Yeah, I like Jim. Uh, yeah, he's he's a, he's, a, he's a definitely a talent. Uh, an, he's an enormously normal. talented actor. You mentioned uh, when you uh, when you after you made uh, Canaan Land, uh, of all the people you would think that would have accepted it, the the very the very the very uh, I guess the very place where it was created from 
uh, sort of backlashed on you, and you and you've have faced some uh, some unexpected criticism from from basically the people that you would think that would be that would relate best to your film, but they've actually uh, they've actually. Yes, I was hurt by uh, some Christian friends who re rejected the film and even uh, disassociated from it. I had some friends that were associated with it, like they were backing it or they had contributed or had their names on it as associate producers and those sort of things. And some of them uh, got scared and wanted to take their name off and detach from me because um, they're, they're in churches where the preacher says something along the lines of, the Bible says, touch not God's anointed. So we shouldn't criticize uh, preachers at all. That divides the church. And, and, and that's kind of like knocking the church. We shouldn't show anything negative, that, that type of thing. So that was pretty hurtful to me because some of my friends in the church world um, didn't even give the film a fair chance. I mean, a lot of them did this without even seeing the whole film. And I said, well, just watch the whole film. You'll see the redemptive ending. But um, it's, the me it's the message of redemption. That's what the film is about. Yeah. And the possibility th that that God has to change lives, his power yeah, yeah. to touch lives and change people's hearts. Yes. And um, recently, um, when I was in New York at a, fil a Christian film festival called Great Lakes Christian Film Festival, um, I had a little bit of anxiety about it because I thought, well, some Christians judged the film. And um, so I thought, well... I guess my own inner circus of my brain was telling me negative stuff. Like what if they might judge me in this film? And, um, you know, because it's a Christian thing and, you know, I had the most wonderful experience. The people at this Christian film festival were so loving and kind and they just embraced the film. They embraced me. They were very kind. They even reached out to me in a personal way. And, and, um, uh, I'm, I'm, shooting a, a child's a story, Lucy and the Lake Monster in New York. And they said, we want to help you with your New York film because we're in New York. And so they people rallied to try to, you know, and they, they gave the film an award for the most uh, creative feature film of all the films at this Christian Film Festival, which is hundreds and hundreds of films, that this was uh, by far the most creative feature film, they said, in the whole Christian Festival. So that was very healing for me to have Christians from all over. I mean, this was a festival they honored Gavin McLeod's memory, who was a great actor on Mary Tyler Moore and many other shows and was a Christian actor. They had a special tribute to him. There were all, um, uh, Jim Caviezel's film, I think was a part of this. Uh, uh, some of his work was in this uh, f festival, I believe. And uh, uh, Rich Cristiano, all these well-known Christian filmmakers uh, were connected to this event. And they all honored Canaan land. So that was very healing for me because, you know, you try not to take rejection personally when someone doesn't like your film. Because when you create something, of course, some people will like it and some people will not like it. And you got to try to not receive it as a personal rejection. But when it's so from the heart, it's hard not to feel uh, personally rejected by that. So I just um, had the most it, it was one of the most beautiful times of my life to be in New York at this Christian film festival and to have them honor Canaan land. It meant so much to me. I mean, was it really? How? I mean, it was. It must have been both discouraging, but at the same time, you know, you're going like, you know what? I'm doing it. I'm, I must be doing something right, because let's face it. And I'm going to be honest with you. I've been sort of like holding back a little bit, but I'm going to be honest with you both. L listen, the, the American church, as we know it, and uh, it's, it's a hotbed of hypocrisy. You know, it really is. I mean, the, just the fact that that your movie got treated with a lot of disrespect is proof of that because instead of looking at your film for what it's saying like you know the, the you know like you can be better than what you're doing you you really can help people you don't have to exploit them you can really truly be helpful for for a, for a church world to to take a dim look upon that you as both you as a person and as a filmmaker but, you know, it must have felt good, though, No, at the same time that while you're hearing this backlash, you must have known that, you know what, I'm doing something right because I'm getting this kind of reaction. I must have touched somebody's nerve. <laughs> and uh, what about you, Rebecca? Did, did you know, did you face any, any uh, uh, blowback from your role with Sister Sarah? Did anybody uh, did anybody disapprove of yours or? You know that you. Knew. I haven't received any of that. No, I think Richard's gotten the brunt of it. Maybe people are just too nice to <laughs> to say anything to my face, but I really haven't. But um, 
you know, we we as a church have to be welcoming of criticism. You know, I mean, as people, I, I faced criticism my whole life. I mean, that's when you when you're courageous enough to put yourself out there <laughs> and put yourself on the line, you're 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 judged. I mean, you go in from in front of the camera and you have a whole team from the advertising agency people and the agents and the product and the owners of the product and the, everybody, the whole creative team. You know, they're they're picking you apart. You know, and um. When when you step on a set, the director is going to criticize your performance. But criticism is what makes us better. You know, we we you, we should welcome analysis, and that's what criticism is. And and use it as as a as a motivation to you know become our best selves. Yeah, I agree with and, that. And the that. and the church especially should be open to criticism. Um, yeah, I think yeah. there is a lot that's going to be coming out and revealed in the very dis near future, actually, not too yeah, distant, yeah. not too far away. Um, yeah. I think I think if you walked inside most churches with that attitude right there, I think most of the churches you would you wouldn't like your re you wouldn't like the reaction. You're right. <laughs> what you're saying that's is right. right. But the reaction well, you would expect is would not. I don't think you would. Because they would. They would I had I you know, I had a friend of mine just today tell me that, um, you know, this is a person that's a, a very strong Christian and their pastor said something like, you should never criticize me. God has put me in the authority here. Anyone that says anything negative or disagrees with anything of my messages or the way I run this church, that's because they have a devil and a demon and they, um, you know, they, they need to just leave. And, you know, I understand pastors are under a lot of stress and they maybe want to have unity in their church or whatever. But a lot of times, like like Rebecca said, criticism should be welcomed. They don't welcome any criticism, but that's mm -mm. that's a problem in the religious world because people are trained to not question their pastors, to not question their preachers, their priests, their rabbi. But that's very, very dangerous because it mm -hmm. kind of gets the wiring of their brain to just accept whatever they're told. And well, pastors not, are people too. Yes. And 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 they get misinformation at times too. Oh yeah, and, we're seeing that now, aren't we? I mean, we really are. I mean, we're really seeing that now in the country. I mean, it, you know, it's got to hurt both of your hearts, you know, to, to see what's going on and, you know, and, and you and you because I can definitely see that your your faith is very uh, very important to both of you. It's it's absolutely critical to who you are as people. In fact, I would say I would sit there and say it's safe to say that your faith is number one in in both your lives. Exactly, and and continuing with that line of thought, I respect my pastor as the authority in the church, but I must answer to God, mm -hmm. and. And I believe that it is a pastor's responsibility, not just to know the Bible and to teach the Bible, but to be well informed of current events so that he can guide his congregation correctly in the choices and decisions that they must make in life and in our current environment. So we must be very discerning about what is true, seek the truth. Uh, use our discernment as to what is right and wrong in the current mainstream media and share that with each other and not be afraid of discussion. Um, I want to go back to your, both your creative sides here, because I'm, I'm curious to, to think how I want to see how your process works. Uh, Rebecca, you're a songwriter besides being a singer, uh, which is, I think it's really cool. I, I love singer songwriters. So what is your process for, for when you, uh, when you start, wanting to be creative. I mean, how do you, how do you, um, what kind of mood do you set for yourself when you start um, songwriting? I write, but I don't consider myself um, that I consider myself mainly a performer and interpreter of music. And I know instantly whether a song speaks to me, whether whether it um, touches my heart, because if it doesn't touch the performer's heart, then we can't communicate that to an audience. Um, how about you, uh, Richard? What do you what, what do you do for your writing process, for your creative process? 
like when you uh when you get a, an idea for a script i mean what do you do well um term, you know? my foundation like theological foundation is that god is the creator and another word for creator is artist so artists a, 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 a good healthy artist likes to encourage other people's creativity so i believe god supports our creativity so when we get a creative idea I just like to go with it and go with that fire. So I will write it down. And before I write a script like into a, you know, format and, you know, in a script format, I usually have hundreds of little notes that I've accumulated. Sometimes I'm in a restaurant, it's on a napkin, or sometimes I'm driving and I pull over and I write on whatever it's handy. Um, sometimes it might be on my phone sometimes, but I mean, that's what I'm going through whenever I write a script is, it might be an image, you know, it might be like, like, for example, in Canaan land, one of my cards said, they're all dressed in white and they're at the beach at the end, you know, like something like that might come to me or, um, you know, the breakup scene. I had a lot of ideas that came to me because the breakup scene where she confronts him is really important. So um, like I had a, a Christian friend, a woman who was an actress friend of mine and she had become a Christian. And and she's a well-known um, person who has had a lot of uh, men interested in her uh, because of her looks and her fame and everything. And when she became a Christian, she said, all of a sudden, all these guys in Hollywood would start like quoting Bible stuff to me and like acting like they were all religious to, to get in my pants. Excuse me, that's a crude expression. But when she said that to me, I was like, really? She goes, yeah, they fake faith to try to get to me. That oh. just like resonated in my mind, like, oh, that's what Sarah could confront, Billy. You just faked faith to get to me. So like sometimes someone will say something. And, and Rebecca, as a singer of popular songs, uh, knows that a lot of these songs come to songwriters from just one line they hear, you know, and they'll write that down. Hank Williams mm -hmm. was like that. He might overhear a conversation in a diner. And he was so prolific, he died in his late 20s. I think he might have been 27. But Hank Williams wrote hundreds and hundreds of great country songs, um, probably the greatest country songwriter ever. But he would hear one little thing, you know, um, like he heard someone say, you're cheating heart to somebody about a woman that cheated on him. And bam, he's, you're cheating heart, we'll make you weep. He just started writing, right? So that inspiration comes. And you just got to get it down and, and just get it down. Don't judge it. I like to write by hand at first because I feel like my arm is connected to my body and my heart. So some people, they're always on the laptop. But I like to like just I have a lot of notebooks and papers at first. In fact, when I met Ron Howard's dad, Rance, and he said, let, let me see what you wrote for your Amy film. This is embarrassing, but we met at the North Hollywood Diner here at uh, Tahunga in Magnolia, and we're having coffee. And I get out this box, and he looks down, and there's hundreds of pieces of paper, and he's picking them up. Hmm, Amy and six women dressed in capes walking the beach. Hmm, he's picking out the cars. And he could have judged me or put me down and said, you look like a disorganized, rumpled, uh, you know, crazy man with hundreds of pieces of paper. But he saw... Very interesting, Richard. I'm kind of the same way. I like to just jot down those ideas at first. He was so sweet. <laughs> and then he just lovingly says, now, you know, you're going to have to sit at a computer and write this all into a script. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, so let me go back to you then, Rebecca, because, I mean, um, as an actress, I mean, do you, is your process different from, from your acting than from when you're singing? I mean, do, do you... Do you accept the script based on what you feel in a heart, or do you ever ever go a script and sit there and say, you know, I like what this thing, I like what this person is trying to say, I, you know, I want to be a part of it. I mean, you don't, you can do either side, right? You could either see it both as an artist through an artist's eye, or you know, through emotionally through the heart. Uh, does it have can it be one or the other, or does it have to be both for you in order to do a part? Well, I, I don't ever look at anything as the size of the role or it's just w whether it hits me and whether um, whether whether you feel it. And I don't think there's an um, a, a, an analytical process that you go through. I think it's 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 something that that hits you and the harder it doesn't. I don't even mind playing evil. I've played a lot of evil women in my in my time. Did you have you really? Actually, 
I, I don't mind playing evil as long as the overall message is that evil is bad and she gets her, her just reward in the end. <laughs> um, so that the message of the piece does not promote evil, but playing the evil character who gets her just desserts is just fine. And some no, of those I, are the more interesting characters <laughs> to play. Some they're, they're, they're really fun. Uh, and I think I, I got to, a lot of those parts actually. I, I have to admit, I, I I've never the, seen you play sort of, part. I think we, we cross talk there. I thought go ahead. Um I, I didn't mean to cut you off. I think there's a little bit of a delay. Well, I think Rebecca uh, played in a villain in a soap opera, didn't you, Rebecca? Oh yes, I did. I wanted to blow up all about Mount Rushmore. In fact, <laughs> in fact, um General Hospital never uh shot on location but we did we actually uh shot at mount rushmore and my character wanted to blow the whole thing up she was terribly terribly wicked but i think oh i God. got a lot of the the evil villainous roles because i had sort of that all-american wholesome look and so they yeah. they wouldn't suspect me yeah being oh, a bad God. girl <laughs> so it was a surprise in the end right, right. Oh my gosh! I I have to admit I I did not know that I did not know that because uh, everything I've ever seen you and I uh, you've always played the you've always played the the, the good part you always yeah. played the, and I did a lot of the sitcoms I love doing comedy I think maybe it's because it's about the rhythm comedy is all about the rhythm and the timing and where the the punchline falls so um, there's something musical about it. You know, if it lands just right. So I think I, I just always love doing those, and I got to work with some great comedic talent. So there's, there's a lot of there's a lot of comedic uh, elements in in, in uh, uh, Canaan Land. I, I you know there there is there is a lot of comedy there. Um, yes. A lot of it's a lot of it's a little bit dark comedy, but it's still there. Mm -hmm. um, yes, in fact, uh, uh, in um, Los Angeles, Patrick at the Marina Del Rey at the uh, at the Cinemark Theater, uh, as Billy got into his preaching and you know, his conning, uh, there were some people laughing so loud that sometimes his next line, I wouldn't quite hear it. And um, that's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, one of the guys was laughing so hard he fell off his seat, but they really got the humor where Billy, you know, talks about um, he has his Jesus soap and if, for, a, for a donation of a thousand dollars, it'll wash away your sins and anoint your body. You'll get healed if you use this soap, all that crazy stuff that televangelists do. But they yeah, got the humor of it. And now, they isn't that something, now, now, you would actually think, honestly, you would actually think, you know, to this fo the folks in the chat, you would actually think that someone actually coming up there and saying, this is my Jesus soap and you can, you know, wash away your sins. You would think, actually look at that and think that is just hilarious. Yeah. But I think they would be really shocked to find out that, um, yeah, that they actually do that sort of thing. Yeah, in fact, almost actually, everything Billy really did. Yeah. They now, actually do that. Really did I got from actual televangelists? You know, like there's a scene towards the end where he asks for donations, and he says, "If you're a single woman out there and you send a generous donation, you're gonna get that spirit-filled, rich, handsome husband. I guarantee it." Well, it's so obviously exploitive, but I saw a preacher do that. He told he he said, "If you give a thousand dollars, you single women are gonna get the 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 handsome, rich husband," and you saw the women whipping out those checkbooks. <laughs> faster than you can imagine. I mean, I actually saw this in a church, you know, but that kind of stuff. I'm in, I was with a few friends of mine that knew I was writing Canaan Land. One of my friends that was with me, Lindsay, um, she actually has a small part in the film when Billy visits the orphanage, he gives a donation for the children at this home. But uh, Lindsay was beside me when a preacher was doing this kind of shtick at the offering. And Lindsay said to me, I knew you'd be right this down <laughs> for the film. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, you know, I, 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 I watched some of those televangelists, so I actually know that you're, you know, like I've seen that too. I've seen that the deception and the, uh, and and the folly, and and um, it, it's absolutely insane. You just wonder, you wonder how they get away with it. It just it staggers. It's it's staggering that you know even today they're still doing it. They're yeah. just a lot more. They're just a lot more creative. You know, um, you know, you got. Well, <sighs> to take advantage of people is wrong, but to take advantage of it, of people using God's name is despicable. Yes. yes. 
Yeah, yeah I think it does good. a lot of damage. It, I think it ruins a lot of people's hopes. It and does. to be taken advantage of and coming in there and conning them out of their money or their house or stuff like that. And it's just, it's a heart, it's heartbreaking because it happened a to lot me. of times the person who's being victimized is in a really vulnerable place. You know, yeah, it actually happened to me. I was actually a victim of it. Um, I, of course, you never like to admit your own stupidity, but when I was a young uh, man, I was making uh, good money for a young guy playing guitar sometimes in clubs. And, um, you know, my, my friends are going to school and I'm making money playing on weekends. But um, I'd had a, a thousand dollars on me. And um, there was a preacher that claimed he was a prophet, a Pentecostal preacher. And what had happened was he found out I had a thousand dollars on me from the gig. And I was a new new to the whole born again christian world i prayed this what they call the sinner's prayer where you ask christ in your life and i was really sincerely 100 percent wanting to follow the lord so if a preacher told me something i took it very serious right? right so he came to me i'll never forget it i won't say his name but i still remember his name and he's still at the same shtick um mm. and he told me that god had shown him i had a thousand dollars on me and someone had just told him that I was a guitar player and I just made a, had a gig and, and that I was a popular guitar player in the, in the area and that, that someone had paid me a thousand dollars and I did a concert. And uh, he said, the Lord show me a thousand dollars. You have a thousand dollars. And, and you're concerned. And somehow I had opened up about my father who was in a mental hospital was bipolar. And he pretty much said, if you give me the thousand dollars, God will heal your father. And, and if you give me this thousand dollars, all your prayers will be answered. Right. Now, I'm a young man, and a part of me was thinking in the back of my mind, wow, that's, I really need this money, and this is a lot of money. And this, But, you know, you're primed to trust these people that say they're prophets, that say they're hearing from God, right? Now, of course, I would never make that same mistake today. But as a young Christian person, I was a victim of it, and sure. I, gave, I gave him the $1,000. I gave him the $1,000. And uh, to me, I when I look into that man, he is living a life of extreme luxury. He's driving around in, you know, new Jaguars and new Mercedes and mansions all over the country. And, you know, here I was. I mean, when my dad was in and out of the mental hospital, my mother could have used that money for food, you know. And but I believe this guy. Sure, and, you're. You're a lot of times they, they they exploit. And this is one thing I saw in in Brother Billy and in, in Canyonland is. A lot of these people were, you know, they're they're in deficit straits. You know, maybe maybe they have a loved one who's dying. Maybe they have one, like you said, who's, in a, who's mentally ill, or whatever the various uh, case may be. Um, and they sense that it's almost it's almost like shark, you know, like a, a shark, you know, can swim around with the of the blood. Yes. They they have they they can smell that, and they and they come out. And I really like the you know, and Billy with brother Billy, he was like that. You know, he would. He would exploit people's weakness and vulnerability yeah. and, and, and go after their money. Yes. Um, you know, yeah, like it's, I mentioned it's, with the single women, he, he, he says, you're out there, you're a woman, you're like 50 to 70 years old and you're really lonely. And he's just exploiting their loneliness and telling them, if you give me this much money, you're going to find a rich spirit filled husband. Oh, and then he says, your grandchildren that are on drugs will get clean. And, and then Billy says, oh, and by the way, you're, you and your husband will have great passion and affectionate uh, sex. I mean, he, he hits every button, right? Right. And, um, and then we show those poor ladies, you know, getting out the cash. And I mean, people were laughing so hard at the theater when we were in the theater and they were showing this. And it seems so ludicrous that people yeah. would believe this. But once again, I got all that stuff from actual evangelists doing this that I heard. Oh, yeah. Oh no, that's that's what's really powerful about this movie. I mean, it's not it's not a you know it's I think how you you put it correctly. It's it's, it's a comedy drama. It definitely is heavy on the drama. I mean, the fact of the matter is that this is still going on today. Hell is going on right now. Even as us three are speaking, you have churches right now that are doing the same thing. They're telling people not to get their vaccination shots. They're telling people to the you know to, to depend. Solely on, on, on what they say, what they tell them, you know, and they're and they're uh, or or telling them to buy the, all these miracle cures that God has blessed them with. There was a church in Arizona that was doing that last year, and they're exploiting these people. But 
we're talking life and death now. You know, we're not talking yeah. just a brother Billy, you know, counting the thousand dollars. Now you're talking about people who are, you know, are basically exploiting them for their lives. And yeah, I, had, I had a just woman for the record. For the record, I am not getting it. I will not get it. I've done too much research on it. It is not a vaccine. It is an mRNA gene changing therapy. So I, I, I just want to clarify because we're all here together. And just uh, the message of this piece is, is, um, is going out into the world and I have to be clear about where I stand. I have no problem with that. Uh, I have okay. no problem with you saying that. Yeah. Only yeah. in a sense, and that Rebecca and I talk about knows. a lot of things, and we talk about everything in the world. So we yeah. we may not always agree on everything, but we agree on the message of the film. I mean, I I, I got the yeah. vaccination. I'm an honest person. I got the vaccination when it yeah. when it came out. Rebecca uh, has not got it, but 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 we agree. I on have the not, and I and yeah. I will not. Yeah, I've yeah. done fine. too as much research, as- and I and I won't. But I'm not going to lie about it. And say that I've gotten it in order to be able to go into a restaurant in California. I am a person who has the courage of my convictions. I stand on principle. I am for religious freedom, and I know what's in it. Well, again, we'll that religious freedom. So that's freedom. all I'm going <laughs> I'm to say about it. But to get back on our other topic about the um, charlatans and the faith healers, there's another aspect of that that can do tremendous damage. Um, Ronnie Millsap the wonderful country singer who is blind. Uh, I knew him and his wife in Nashville. Mm -hmm. And um, Ronnie tells the story. And he, I think he even tells this story in his autobiography about when he was a little boy and his parents would take him to faith healers, you know, do long drives here and there, going to see the faith healers. Uh, We we should tell about Ronnie Millsap. Ronnie Millsap was a country singer who was I believe he was born blind, right? Yes. I think he had sight very, very young, but lost his vision very young. Yeah. Blind. Yeah. And, and blind, them, an incredible all, piano player. And they took uh, him to all these faith healers that, that, that blamed him if he didn't get the healing, right? Rebecca? Well, his parents blamed him all the way home mm. and blamed him that it, it was all his fault. He didn't believe because all he needed was the faith of a mustard seed. And if he couldn't believe more than that, then it was his fault. And you know, that kind of that kind of thing can can do tremendous damage. And yeah. it can alienate alienate someone from God and take years to 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 to, to find that again. And uh, only, it, it's, God, it's so God. damaging. I mean not only from God but from your your, your fellow human beings. I mean you look at the in Canaan land we go back to uh, uh, look at the damage that Brother Billy did. I mean, he not only did he damage his his all his friends and his coworkers, but he he really hurts uh, Sister Sarah because yeah. Sister Sarah was was you know she was open to a relationship. She wanted to have love. She should have been able to have love. There's nothing that says that she shouldn't have had a relationship. But all of a sudden, lo and behold, the tr- the trust had been broken. You know, and it hurt a lot of people. You know, the uh, the 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 misconceptions and the and the lies and the deceptions. You know, it does hurt a lot of people. And, and, and you know, it, it can really, you know, a lot of people, they don't realize that the damage they leave in their wake, you know, it, it hurts a lot of people. They just only see for themselves. I thought it was really, I thought it was really a really good thing that, that Billy did, you know, he realized that he was, he had hurt a lot of people. And yeah, and Rebecca confronts that, him, Rebecca's sister Sarah confronts him at the end on the beach. and. I, I just uh, love the final scene. Rebecca and I had a lot of conversation about it. Yeah, we did. And, and uh, mm-hmm. Rebecca really wanted to make sure it came across that she confronted him about the hurt, and that mm-hmm. he had to have it. He had to really show by his actions that he changed. And we didn't. One thing about an indie film is we didn't have to do a typical Hollywood happily ever after ending because. Um, you know, Billy and Sarah, I believe deep down they love each other and Billy loved her. But at the very end, you know, we didn't, you know, wrap up the present with a bow and say, oh, they're back together. Yeah, but, I like that. Like, she can't trust him, really. Like, after well, all I, that hurt, you know. And I yeah. wanted to make the message to, to to women out there, all women who have been hurt by men, all women who have had their trust broken, 
trust is broken like that. Yeah. It only takes a second to break trust. And, and but in so order hard. to regain it, it takes consistency over time. Yeah. She was willing to forgive and to give him that time, but trust must be earned. Yes, I agree. And I think I think you did a really good job uh, in your script writing, uh, uh, Richard, and and not having that uh, and not having that happy ending. Um, how much? I mean, how, how see, much? See, I, I saw it as a happy ending. I I see the ending as a happy ending because she oh, gave yeah. him her most prized possession, her Bible. She wanted him. She gave him the opportunity to earn back her trust. Mm -hmm. So do you think though do you think those two and eventually would would reconnect? Well, you know, we talked about, we <laughs> we've talked, talked about a lot sequel. about uh sequel, haven't we, Richard? Yeah, we're thinking a sequel or maybe a cable TV show they could um we could extend the story because it really has an ending that lends itself to, itself to a sequel because at the end Rebecca prays um something along the lines of I know you have big plans for Billy and um you see him walk away at the Santa Monica Pier, you know. So yeah, I think, because I think Billy would have a lot of, I mean, because he's so new, you know, he's so, for the first time, he's so new in his in his faith that, you know, he, there's a lot of temptation out there. I mean, you just yeah. don't, you know, just because you put on a white outfit doesn't necessarily make you all white. You know, <laughs> yeah. you're still gonna, you, I mean, the one thing, one thing about white clothes is it's the easiest to get dirtiest. So, yeah. I mean, I think Billy and because of his journey, how effective can he be mentoring others yeah, and, he and encouraging them in their faith? Because he's not this, you know, idol upon a pedestal, you know, he's, he's lived life and he's lived all those temptations. So he can relate to others and others can relate to him. Um, let me ask you guys a, a quick question. I mean, you know, both of you guys, since you guys are both acting, um, what are, what are the what have what have been some of your favorite roles? I mean, you know, Richard, let's start with you. What have, what have been like three of your favorite roles that you've done in your career that you're most proud of? Well, um, you know, Billy is a role that kind of is multiple roles in it in its development because. I did a play, I played the lead in the play of Elmer Gantry, and I was very honored because the Richard Brooks estate, Richard Brooks is not as well known today, but he was a really great director. He directed Elmer Gantry in 1960, which won a bunch of Oscars. He directed, um, I think he directed In Cold Blood with Robert Blake about those murders based on the Truman Capote book. He directed so many great films. And his estate um, granted uh, for me to play Elmer Gantry on stage and put his work on stage. This was back in the late nineties. And um, I got a lot of reviews. A lot of celebrities came to the performance. And, and at that point they were talking about remaking that film. Uh, I mean, Q Shadri, the director I mentioned earlier was raising $20 million to remake it. And I backed out of it because I thought I was too green to do this big part, even though I did it as a play. And I thought, you know, it's such a classic. I don't want to be compared to the classic. But the story was in my mind. So the Elmer Gantry role was in the back of my head. And then when I did this Sister Amy Simple McPherson film, I found out that, that Sinclair Lewis, who wrote the 1927 novel Elmer Gantry, his inspiration for Elmer Gantry was Amy Simple McPherson's third Ooh. husband. He was like this con artist guy. And I played her third husband in that film. And so I'm actually, it's three different parts. But when I wrote Canaan Land, Brother Billy is just like the modern incarnation of the Elmer Gantry, David Hutton, and Sister Amy. So I just love the part. Now, now I've done other parts I like. I like to do people with a lot of levels. Uh, Rebecca mentioned that villains are kind of fun. Um, I did on stage the um, Jack Nicholson part in One Flew Over a Cuckoo's Nest. And I, you know, acting can be so healing and so therapeutic because, like, my father was in and out of mental hospital. So doing that part about a man, a man with mental illness, that was very healing for me. And so I, I've got often got parts that related to something in my life. And, you know, I used to have a healing ministry in the traditional sense in the church, but I really feel art is a ministry and art brings healing because I think when you put your heart into your acting, it can be healing for you first, but there can also be a meditation and a healing for the souls of other people too. I, I agree in, in a lot of ways. Um, you know, like I, I mean, there are some wounds that can't be healed. Uh, there are some that just won't. It's just they're 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 permanent. They're 
soul food. But but you can learn to, to adapt and work with it. And um, so I agree with that. I I agree with that very much. I'm I'm just dying to ask Rebecca because I I mean I are, I I'm just trying I'm trying to wrap my head around this uh, uh you playing a villain and, and like now <laughs> now I really now I really want to go see that because it's like I I just trying to imagine you being a villain and I oh, just by the I, way I, there's a I Bible movie that she played kind of a villainous woman which was the Book of Ruth oh and, yeah and she plays a real snarky kind oh, of okay. judgmental nasty woman in that and it's based on the biblical book of Ruth and it's a really nice uh faith based film okay that's another one that she did a villain i don't know if you'd call it a villain but i i i didn't she definitely had a snarky kind of judgmental villainous air about her wouldn't you say i think her? there was an episode of my camera too i i i pull out a gun and it's the su surprise of the episode but what oh my gosh i can't yeah. believe it. Look at you. How can you play a villainous? <laughs> when you asked about favorite roles, um, I love doing the the sitcoms, you know, Night Court with the wonderful comedian um, actor, John Larroquette. Uh, in fact, they asked me to do a second one of those, but I was bar already booked on another show. And that was um, the same group of guys who had done uh, Barney Miller. I did an episode mm -hmm. of Barney. Um, uh, Knight Rider, of course, has to be one of my favorites just because of all the friends that I've made around the world um, uh, who are fans of the show. And I continue to make friends and uh, wonderful relationships because of that show. So the, the aftermath of the show has been uh, a real blessing in my life for that reason. Um, I did a lot of films overseas. I did one in uh, the Philippines. Uh, and that one was a big action movie. I got to shoot M16s, um, do bow and arrows, uh, do lots of fights, even sword fighting. So that was fun just for all the stunts we get to do. Um, because in the States, they never let you do those for <laughs> for insurance purposes. You know, the, all, the double always goes in. So I had a ball doing, doing that particular one for that reason. Um. Um, but a painful. lot of stage stage roles too. Um, Nancy and Oliver was probably one of my uh, favorite musicals to do. Lola and Damn Yankees. Mm. Was that painful for you as a? Because uh, I don't know uh, how close you were to him, but I mean, but just watching it from the outside, it's still had to be painful. Was it pretty painful watching what happened to David Hasselhoff after after uh, after you know you you know his. It seemed like his whole life was put out in the public eye. Was it pretty? Was it painful to watch that? Were you... Well, David remains a friend. Good. He, he remains a good friend, and uh, you know, David chooses what he wants to do, and uh, he he got married again, and I I I think he's living the life he wants to live. David's a sweetheart. You no, know? yeah, I mean he, I, he, I know everybody. Everybody saw, you know what he went through with addiction and, and that sort of thing. And, um, you know, maybe, maybe it's helpful to people knowing that people that they have on pedestals, you know, they, they're real people too with yeah. failings and flaws and weaknesses. Um, but I, I think David's doing well. Good. Good. But you know, you know, one really wants to see that. I mean, you know, it was really, you know, as a fan of, of somebody you like, you know, you don't want to see them get hurt. You know, I think you know, filming someone when they are, not aware of it is a very cruel thing to do. Yeah, and that happened to him. Yes, yeah. Did, yeah. And and it no, makes no, you no wonder no. about the people that you, that you have around you and who can you trust. And that probably um, uh, it makes people question their circle and who they can trust. And I think that was very invasive. What was done to them. Um, when you know someone has a as a weakness, uh, yes, you, you that there is some lines you do not cross, and yeah, I think I that line was crossed. Yeah, there's a biblical story. Or that footage and that video would not have been available to go viral. You know, yeah, that yeah, was an intrusion into his life. Yeah, there's a Bible so, story about Noah after the flood, and it it talks about Noah after all the stress of that flood, he got drunk on the wine, right? And it said he was laying there naked, and um, and one of, and his sons like covered him up. And I said that one of the sons came in and and kind of mocked him being drunk and uncovered his nakedness and his drunkenness. And um, 
in it in the story it said he was cursed for exposing his father's nakedness well one of the early church fathers uh, augustine said you have the literal stories of the bible but that there's many deep spiritual truths on an allegorical level and right. to me like exposing noah's drunkenness and nakedness and the curse of that coming upon the person is that you know as rebecca said you know as humans humans have addictions and sins and weaknesses and it's not christ-like to um, expose their drunkenness and nakedness in a shaming way like that because you you see the story of the woman caught in adultery when they all wanted to stone her jesus um said let him that's without sin throw the first stone yes. and they they left and then jesus who who the bible says was sinless he said neither do i condemn thee go and sin no more. So he, Jesus is never wanting to shame people and expose their weakness. He's there to heal them and forgive them and restore them. And the problem in our media today is like, I mean, I know like we want to know things and I know like journalists want to expose things, but there's kind of like a gotcha journalism today that wants to just like expose and bring up the worst things about people. And I mean, I understand like, like we want to know what's really going on, you know, like corruption or sins in the world and things like that. But it's really interesting. I, I, I talked to a man that was with JFK back in the day and um, I won't go into a litany of the details, but he said that there were things about JF, JFK's personal sins and flaws and that reporters knew about some of it, but they felt like out of respect for him that that wasn't appropriate to just leak all that stuff. No, no, you know? now, yeah. I mean, back then, you know, like, I mean, the journalism, I mean, you know, it's just like anything else. It's things have changed, you know, you know, it's like, you know, back in, like you said, back in the thirties when back in the revivals, you know, God was, God was with America. God was here. God was, you know, moved, moved to, uh, uh, prophets and healers and, 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 and ministers. And today, now you don't see that. Now you got a lot of gotcha. You know, you got a lot of people coming up there saying, come out here, you know, and on a, a lot of different levels, be it journalism or religion. It's the same thing. You know, they're, 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 they're all about exploiting people to, to, for their own personal gain. They don't really care about the persons they're exploiting. Only thing they care about is getting the ratings or getting the money. Yeah, I could be There's no very empathy wealthy. anymore. Yes. There's I no be empathy. Very well, it's, it's, I could be a very, very wealthy man. Yeah, I could be a very wealthy man because as a minister and a lot of uh, well-known um, uh, actors have told me their secrets, you know, and um, uh, everything from pop stars when they had their meltdowns uh, called me to um, some of the well-known actors and filmmakers that we talked about earlier in some of the big films, even some of the big Christian films that came up. But, you know, I've been offered money about that stuff and National Enquirer type people, but I'll tell you what, um, I take it very seriously, confidentiality. If someone confesses their sins and their struggles to me as a friend and, and, and as a ministry, there's no way I'm going to tell their secrets and expose their nakedness to a tabloid just to get money. And, um, you know, I just don't believe in that. I believe that we need to be a safe place so that people can trust us. You know, like in the 12-step recovery movement, one of the steps of the fifth step is to confess your faults to God, to yourself, and to another human being. And, and like when you confess your faults to another human being, it has to be someone you can trust that loves you unconditionally and is not going to shame you and expose you, that's going to want to see you healed and recovered and doing better, like Billy, right? Yeah, Billy had a, he had a part of his redemption, part of his uh, salvation was he had to go back and make restitution to the people he yes. had hurt. That's, yeah. So that's I feel really it. bad about the incident you mentioned. When I saw mm -hmm. that, when I saw David there on the floor in that footage, I just felt terrible for him. I just prayed for him and I felt really bad. And I thought this is terrible that this moment that, you know, but that's our society today. Are you doing okay, Rebecca? Yes, we just have a few little raindrops falling. What? So, oh, my God. It's flooding no in California. No one was kind enough to bring me an umbrella so, <laughs> so we don't get rained out here. Flooding in Cal or you you're in California right now, right? Yes. And we've had some oh very, God. very hot weather in recent days, but today it's like a little fall started. It's very nice uh, out. 
I'm going to go ahead and open this up to uh, anybody in the in the uh, chat that wants, wants to ask you uh, questions. Uh, they're free to uh, ask. Uh, you can ask. Uh, you can ask pretty much almost anything. Um, so feel free to drop a question or two if you if you wish. Boy, this has been really fun. I have to admit, and this they has can been, feel uh, free to write me any questions that they think of later at my yeah. website. Uh, the website is RebeccaHolden.com. My email is Rebecca at RebeccaHolden.com. Mm. Oh, thank you so yeah. much, Professor. Thank you so much. Um, he just commented that uh, it's a great interview. Uh, let's see. It's been, uh, yeah, Michael has mentioned that it's uh, been raining uh, here the, the past two days. Yeah, we had a thunderstorm the day before yesterday that cracked, uh, cracked open and um, really rained hard last week. Uh, in fact, it's, it rained so hard in two hours that all our flood, all our streets were flooded, and I do mean they're flooded. Um, mm -hmm. it looked I was like, wow, I haven't I haven't seen it like that, and and not during the summer. Um, yeah, this has been really extraordinary. Um, and and thank you so much for coming on and being open about it um, with everything. Uh, That's but, what we're here to do. You're welcome. Be open and transparent. Oh, you're surprised, though. Sometimes people they get in this circumstances and they um, you know, they they tend to, to they tend to get really um, you know, they're they getting real nervous and anxious and whatnot. And you know, that's part of me is I'm just trying to let you guys know that you're in good hands. You know, you know, I, I, we'll take you through it. It's not hard. Rebecca, I know you've done thousands of these, so this must be old hat for you. Yeah, in fact, um, you can see Rebecca being interviewed by the by uh, Johnny Carson. On uh, the Tonight yes. Show, I, uh, that's a wonderful interview she did uh, with Johnny Carson back in the day. He was and, a joy. And Dick Cavett was sitting to my right. So wow, <laughs> to be in the center of those two gentlemen was quite yeah. an experience. Yeah, Dick Cavett was a great interviewer. He I sure thought Johnny Carson, was a, Johnny Carson was a good interviewer. Mm -hmm. I would have liked yes, to see him. I would have liked to see him uh, uh, do a little, you know, get away from the uh, talk, you know, the talk show where he was. I would have loved to see him do something like this where he's able to just go deeper, you know, because a lot of those questions, a lot of those shows, they, they do yeah. softball questions. Well, and you know, like Johnny Carson had the capacity to do that. I saw an interview he did with Billy Graham, the evangelist, and they had the most wonderful discussion about faith. And Johnny was honest with Billy about his questions and doubts about it. And Billy Graham was just really gracious. He had just such an ability to talk to people about the gospel in a way that wasn't condescending. Or, But um, if you Google um, Johnny Carson, Billy Graham, it's I mean, it's a classy interview and they're they're from different worlds, different perspectives. But Johnny Carson shows him so much respect, you know, and vice versa. I can say this about the man. He it seemed like he wanted to make his guests look good. Mm -hmm. I think many of the the hosts today are, like you said, going for the laugh, going for the rating, going for the attention themselves. And, and they come off as self-serving and at the expense of the guest. Yeah, that's not and, good. And that's mean-spirited in Very my opinion. Even Merv Griffin and some of the hosts of yesteryear, they they um, they were there to serve the, their guest and the show, and yeah. that was that was just a kindness and a graciousness that yeah. sometimes is lacking in our society these days. Yeah, Larry. Maybe Kuzma. I'm just an old fashioned girl, but well, I think I'm from. <laughs> so the, be I'm, it. I think I'm old fashioned too, because I <laughs> like Larry King uh, would would let people speak their piece too, and. Um, you know, I went to a school that was a very conservative Christian school, Liberty University. It was run by a pugnacious televangelist that founded the moral majority, Jerry Falwell. And uh, so I was around Jerry Falwell at that time, and I was involved in the religious right at that time pretty heavily. And um, Jerry Falwell, I remember talking with Jerry because a lot of people didn't like Jerry Falwell. So they did a lot of gotcha interviews with him, right? And I, I asked Jerry Falwell, I said, um, who, is, who has been the most fair interviewer in the secular world? And, you know, Jerry Falwell said to me, Larry King is a man who is not a Christian man. He's, he's, he said he's, I think he's agnostic. He's from a, a different background than me. 
He said, but Larry King always lets me say what I want to say about the gospel and about my perspective politically. He, he doesn't sit there and try to trap me or argue with me too much. He, he asks insightful questions, but he said he's always fair and straight up with me. And he said, I really respect that guy, you know, and it's you know, nice Larry, to hear. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Uh, that's I, I will have to say this. This is the first interview that I, that I've done that I, I have to be um, I have to be totally 100% walking the mind. Um, which is fine. This is a good experience for me. Um, I uh, <laughs> I have a question from the uh, Professor Fox. Just be yourself, know, Patrick. That's all we want. Oh, trust me, Rebecca. Oh, <laughs> 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 uh, um. <laughs> Uh, I will, I will, uh, Professor Fox. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. I know a lot of people are going to watch this that know me well, that know me personally. Mm -hmm. They're going to be coming up there wondering, how did you do it? Um, and I'm going <laughs> to tell them, with, I'm going to tell them with grace and love. Um, <laughs> Professor Fox wants to know about, uh, if you guys have, uh, 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 YouTube, uh, YouTube channels, cause we're all, a lot of the people in the chat are, they're all YouTubers like myself. Do you guys do you each have uh, YouTube channels that we could uh, I could share with the with the folks? I have tons of uh, YouTube videos on, but they're not my own channel. Um, there are other videos that people have put up, but you can come to my website. And if you start with some of the the videos on the videos page of my website, um, you more YouTubes will just keep coming up afterwards. I think. Yeah, I, I've looked at some of those. You're just radiant. Yeah, uh, you're, you're so sweet. You're absolutely you. gorgeous. I, I I was just like, wow, just beautiful. Wow, well, you know. take my breath away, Patrick. No, you took our breath away many times. <laughs> I just I just love redheads. I mean, that's the thing. Yeah. I, I I just love redheads. Redheads are just that's my kryptonite. <laughs> um, my mom had even redder hair than mine. She was a yeah. real copper. In fact, in fact, her her nickname was was Penny. So um, because of her copper colored hair and it's and it's just amazing um after mom passed away it seems like every time i go into uh a honey wagon or a trailer or a dressing room there's a penny on the floor oh. and i know it's my mom saying hi becca i'm here i'm with you so oh, oh, it's been a real scary. i collect them now good for you um, I, I was just looking to plug in and get some power because I, you know how these tech, these um, laptops and uh, phones and things, I'm on a laptop and I just need to plug. So I moved to a wall socket. But I'm kind of like Rebecca in that if you search Canaan Land or Richard Rossi songs, Richard Rossi music, you see a lot of uh, videos on various channels. Um, um, and I'm thankful to the my dear friend who runs the our fan club, uh, Kelly Tabor, because she got so many of my songs out there streaming and on YouTube and things that I was an old fashioned dinosaur selling records and CDs and LPs. And she said, you know, you need to get your stuff on YouTube and streaming and everything. So, yeah. 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 Uh, Michael's adventure has commented. Uh, um, redheads are beautiful. Yes, they are. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Especially, especially now we found out redheads are doing up to doing some evil things. Now we have to go check that out. I, <laughs> like, um, but, I think what, so I, I want, got their punishment. I think Elena, Elena got hit by a bus. So <laughs> really, I got final Oh my god! Oh my gosh! I just that's that's outrageous. It's amazing. It's still still on, it's still still on the air today. General Hospital is still very much on the air today. Yeah. 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 That show well, has, has been going on for, well, it's the living legend itself. How long were you on the show, Rebecca? About six months to a year, I think. Yeah. 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 The evil ones don't stay around uh, sometimes. <laughs> uh, see, uh, Alan I says that. Alan a lot says longer like than she was originally supposed to. The, the, public seemed to really like her a lot and so they it just kept writing for her so uh alan says he likes your uh umbrella and oh, um, true. i like that umbrella too yeah. thank you yeah. new york times 
See, they they, they still come up with a they still have a reason to exist to make umbrellas. <laughs> Uh, listen, I want to thank you guys. I like. I want to thank you both for coming on to the show, uh, for doing this thank interview. Thank you for having us. And uh, I'd like to thank everybody in the chat who uh, came out in support of the show and asked questions and comments and whatnot. Um, you, what will you be doing next, uh, Richard? What's your next project, real quick? Um, well, we I mentioned the um, the uh, sequel to Canaan Land, and I'm going to grab something real quick because someone just gave me a copy here, but my children's movie that I'm making, co-writing with, with Kelly Tabor, is front page news in the New York newspaper. Um, it says here from, uh, from, cl from classroom to silver screen, because Kelly told these stories about, and that's, I think that's me there with the, the guitar, but I, she told these stories about growing up at the lake as a little girl and seeing this kind of Loch Ness monster type thing, Champ and Lake Champlain. And uh, so we're making a movie, Lucy and the Lake Monster, right now about a little girl who believes in this lake monster. It's an allegory for faith, the story. But um, um, if people want to follow that new film, it's facebook.com slash champ movie. They could like the page. And then Rebecca and I have been talking about doing a sequel to Canaan Land. Um, and Rebecca has some brilliant ideas about how it could be an ongoing series where Billy and Sarah help people. And I know Rebecca has some, some folks she knows that are developing a cable network. And so I think we have some great- And by the way, I should give you some new news. Um, it goes live, it launches in uh, September 18th called iTube 24-7. And it will be in 780 million homes. Wow. So, Richard, we have a wonderful home for our series. Yes. That's wonderful. Yes. That's wonderful. And Rebecca, as I mentioned before, she's already won a couple acting awards for Sister Sarah. So um, her acting in Canaan Land is, um, I think it's like she's done so much in her career. And um, it's just wonderful that like fine wine gets better through time. Yeah. I mean, you know, That's she, very sweet. she did Night Rider and all these great songs. And here, here in the 21st century, she's winning acting awards. I mean, oh. think about that. Cause the eighties was like, 80s a while 90s. back. <laughs> so that's, you talk about child like, I was. You talk uh, about like a new favorite. Uh, film and development with Kevin Sorbo, mm -hmm. Paul Paths. Uh, I was just chosen as the face for a new jewelry line, the Renoir brand legacy line uh, with Stephen Zale, who was the designer for his family jewelers, uh, Zale Jewelers, which then went public. But then he remained uh, an independent designer and he has partnered with Emmanuel Renoir, who is actually the grandson of the grand master artist, uh, Claude Renoir. So we're very excited about this new jewelry line. Wow. And we have a new album coming out in Nashville. So lots, yeah, lots of exciting things on the horizon. And of course, uh, Richard mentioned our, our, our sequel to uh, Canaan Land, which may launch into a, a whole series. So, well, you know, I need to mention, I didn't mention, uh, uh, man, the marketing people would really slap my hand on this, but um, Can the website for the movie is CanaanLandMovie.com. And if you haven't seen Canaan Land yet, or you want to see it again, it's streaming in three places. You can either see it on Amazon Prime, or you can see it at ChristianCinema.com. That's a Christian film site run by a couple brothers, Bobby and Kevin Downs, ChristianCinema.com, Amazon Prime, or Vimeo.com. Any one of those places, just put in Canaan Land and you can watch it. It also will be in more festivals. Um, yeah, I'll be dropping the links down below for uh, both that and for Rebecca's uh, website for sure. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. I appreciate yep, no that. Uh, I will let you go because our time is up. And uh, I want to, again, thank everybody. And I will see you guys back here on Thursday with our uh, guest, Dustin uh, and Dean, uh, who will be here. The show will start at 8 o'clock, and uh, we will see you then. Um, if you guys just want to stay there for a second. Okay. What uh, a pleasure, uh, like Patrick. The, thank you so thank much. You. Uh -huh. Thank Enjoyed you. It.
Thank you, Rebecca, for coming on. I enjoyed it. Thank you, Richard. That was